Good afternoon. So I stand between you and spring break, right? So I've got a tough, tough job. I would like, before I get started on this presentation or this talk, to get you guys going just a little bit, because you probably had lunch, you're probably tired, you're probably ready to go. So do me a favor and stand up. Oh man, we're gonna play two games. Yeah, yeah. The first game is called Shake, Shake, Shake. All you're gonna hear me do is say, Shake, Shake, Shake. And you're gonna walk around, you're gonna shake people's hands. Shake, Shake, Shake. And, yeah, some of you might do a different shake, but I need you shaking hands. All right? And, and, when I, when I say stop, I'm just going to ask, I'm going to say something and you need to exchange whatever I'm asking between you and that person. You with me? All right. So here we go. We're going. Shake. Shake. Go ahead. Move around. Shake. 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 Stop. If there's only three of you, that's all good. So tell that person, tell that person your name or persons, your name, and if you could be a superhero, who would that be? Shake, 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 keep moving, shake, 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 stop! Tell that person your name. And if you had a song playing in your car right now, what would that song be? <laughs> shake, 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 stop! Tell that person your name. Tell that person your name. Patrick, I'm John. And, and if you have a nickname, what is it? And if you don't, hey, and if you don't, what would it be? My nickname was JJ growing up. Project Pat? <laughs> awesome. All right, let's get back to your seats. Back to your seats. Okay, this is, a, this is one more game and then, and then it's on. This game is called That's Me. Very, very simple. When I make a statement that resonates with you, you stand up and you would say, that's me. You with me? So, so let's, let's just test drive that real quick. I go to Memphis Catholic. That's, that's everybody, right? So some of you are just like, either mentally like, bro, I'm not standing up. Okay? I'm just saying, right? But that's simple. If I say something that resonates with you, stand up and you say, that's me. Okay, you ready? All right, bear with me. We're almost on spring break. I'll get you there. We're almost there. All right. So the first one is... I prefer Snapchat over Twitter. All right. Okay. There we go. And I see we're waking up because it wasn't even just that me. It was like that's me. Right? Like there was some stuff in there. All right. I prefer Instagram over Snapchat. Why? Hey, don't 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 fall into the peer pressure. Do you? Do you? Okay, good. You ready? <laughs> MySpace. Wow. You don't even know what MySpace is, man. <laughs> You're like, oh, my granddaddy does, though. You know, grandpa knows. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Chick fil A is better than McDonald's. Yes! Okay. 
go at Chick-fil-A. Hey, where I'm from, I gotta drive like 35 minutes to get into a Chick-fil-A. I saw like three on the way here. It's great. Okay. Facebook is for old people. Finally, I finally got my man to stand up. Hey. Hey, I'm not gonna lie. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. That kind of stung just a little bit. Just a little bit. I'm not even gonna show you my phone. Okay? Alright. Here we go, so we get a little deeper. I uh, mean, maybe, maybe a little bit deeper. My parents don't understand me. That's me. Okay. All right. Hey, for those of you who just stood up, for those of you who just stood up, your parents are waiting for you in the parking lot. Just kidding. Just kidding. We're just kidding. All right. I can't live without my music. Okay. <laughs> are you good? You all right? All right. Okay. Here we go. Last one. I know you guys are having fun, huh? You're like, no, you're gonna to, we're going to have to talk in a minute, okay? Last one. I believe that true love still exists. That's me. All right. Appreciate it. Hey. Thank you, ladies and the three gentlemen who stood up. I'm with you. Okay, so my name is John Sablon, and I'm coming to you by way of Northern California, all the way from California. So uh, I, this is my first time to Tennessee, which is my first time to Memphis. And so everybody's been very welcoming. I appreciate the love I've received since I've gotten here last night. So I want to know grade-wise, seventh graders, where you at? Oh, look at it. We're proud. Okay. Eighth graders, where you at? Yeah. Now, I heard the freshmen are gone, right? Fresh what? Freshmen. They here? Okay. Sophomores, where you at? All right. Juniors, where you at? <laughs> Seniors! Seniors! Oh, I am. Real life's coming. Real life's coming, seniors. Right? <laughs> so, hey, say, juniors are like, bye, right? Seniors are like, what? whatever, okay. So I want you to take a trip with me back to my junior year in high school, okay? It's like three years ago. Just kidding, just kidding. Longer than that, trust me. My junior year in high school, okay? So I'm in advanced placement courses. Any of you who, who may be exposed to AP, right? You know about that AP grind? Right? Study, 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 read, 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 study, 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 all that. So it's the spring semester of my junior year. And there was a, uh, one of the students in my class who had a gracious family member who had like a, access to like a beach house. So what we did was our teacher said, look, you guys are working really hard. And we're getting ready for this AP exam, right? So, hey, we're going to go out. We're going to study. But we're also going to have some fun. So it's like, cool. So we go out there. They got the approval of all the parents. So we're out there for three days. Well, on that second day, when we get to just kind of hang out, we're all at the beach, you know, people making sandcastles, people just chilling out. One of my friends is like, hey, bro, you want to go boogie boarding? And I'm like, boogie boarding? <laughs> yeah, I was like that too, girl. I'm like, boogie boarding, because I grew up kind of ghetto. So when she, he said boogie, I was like, boogie, right? And he's like, no, boogie boarding is like surfing, only it's not. I'm like, I still don't know what it is, right? And he's like, it's, what, bro, are you scared? And I'm like, Pfft. I look around, right, who's watching? Scared? I'm like, no, give me that boogie board, right? So we start walking out. Everybody's watching. John, because I was kind of a leader right out there. So I was like, everybody's watching. And in reality, so we're walking out to the, to the, to the beach, right? And in reality, I'm terrified. Because the last time I was in the water was when my dad threw me in the, in the pool at 11 to teach me how to swim, right? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Swim like a rock, straight to the bottom. So I'm like, well, I'm not trying to touch water. It looks nice. You know, it looks nice, but here we go. So I'm like, okay, I'm following this guy. So we're swimming, right? We're putting our heads down. I, don't even, I couldn't even swim that well, but I'm just like, all right, I'm gonna be cool. People are watching. So I'm swimming, we're swimming, we're swimming. Next thing you know, we look up and we're like way past the buoys. And he's like, hey, bro, 
I think we went too far. And I'm like, you think? He goes, maybe we should swim back. I'm like, yeah, let's do that, right? So we start swimming, right? So we're swimming hard as we can. Only one problem. We're getting pulled back. So I look up, and he looks up, like, we got to keep swimming. So we start swimming, swimming, swimming. We're further back. We got caught in a riptide. The harder you swim, the more you go backwards. So we got, we got to call for help. Right? So we start, we're trying to balance ourselves on these boogie boards, and we're like, help! We see some people, right? You can see them, they look like ants. Help! Right? We're yelling, we're yelling, we're yelling. And you can see them, they're like, oh, hey, look at them. They're so cute, they're having fun out there. <laughs> they're kind of far, but you know, they're kids, they'll get over it, right? They keep walking. So I'm like, okay, what are we gonna do? So my friend, he happens to get out of the riptide somehow, as we keep trying, right? And then he's like, bro, take my boogie board. And so he gives me his boogie board. He starts swimming back to the, to the shore like Michael Phelps. I'm over here getting ready to die, right? I'm like, I'm 16 years old. My life's in front of me. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to die. I'm going to start praying. So as a Catholic, I'm like, well, I'm going to pray the Hail Mary. So I'm like, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And then boom, wave hits me, moves me a little bit closer. I'm like, OK, let's try this again. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And then boom. A wave hits me. I'm like, shoot, I'm going to pay the whole rosary. I don't even know what it is, but I'm going to pray it. I'm going to try it, right? And then boom, wave hits me. It gets me close enough to where people can come and reach me and grab me and pull me onto the shore. And there I was, shivering, just like a little baby, freaked out. In all reality, I had no business being out there. Somebody poked at my chest, called out my manhood, and here I am thinking I was tough. And I kissed that ground when I ended up back on the shore. So what does that have to do with anything right now? There's two oceans that all of us, in particular your generation, is faced with. An ocean of distraction, an ocean trying to drown God out, faith out, snatch up your precious souls out of your body. That ocean that tells you you are the sum total of your circumstance. You ain't gonna amount to nothing. And then you got this other ocean of God's mercy and love that tells you I made you for something great. So before I go any further, let me explain to you a little bit about me. Because what happens is, okay, we're at Catholic high school, we're wearing uniforms, and then you get a speaker up here, and there's an assumption or misconception that this person don't know what struggle is. I mean, I know people judge me like, man, John, what you know about the struggle in Memphis is real, right? What you know about struggle? So I was, I'm, I'm from the island of Guam. So for those of you who thought I was Hispanic, shame on you. Okay, you're like, what? Yeah, right, people are, everywhere I go, especially in Cali, right? They're like, they try to speak Spanish. I'm like, I'm, I'm not Hispanic. They're like, it don't matter, you look like one. You should speak Spanish, right? I'll be like, I, I'm confused, I'm from the island of Guam. Right? So I'm, I'm not Hispanic or Latino. I'm from the island of Guam. It's a Pacific Islander, like Hawaiian, Samoan, Tongan, right? Something like that. So I'm from the island of Guam, a very Catholic island. I was born into the faith 27 days after I was physically born, but I wasn't really raised in the faith. You see, because I had a father who was an alcoholic. And anybody who deals with alcoholism, experiences alcoholism, knows the trauma, the humiliation, and the struggle of that life. So not only did I experience mental, physical, emotional abuse, watching me and my siblings get beat, getting beat myself, watching my mom get beat. By the way, I had a family member who sexually molested me all by the age of 11. So by 11 years old, y'all, 11 years old, my idea of God, self, self-worth, people, was completely destroyed and ripped out. 11. Anybody here here? 11? You're like, I just turned 12. I'm safe. Right? But 11 years old. I should be worried about, you know, what to wear for school. So when I step on stage, my point is to let you know that I know about struggle. It's no surprise that if I experience all that by age 11, age 12, I get arrested. And then I get exposed to everything that's dark in the world. 
whether that be pornography, drug abuse, alcohol, sexual promiscuity, gang related, everything that's tugging at you. Did I, and I, you know what happened is I, I ran with the wrong crowd. I found broke people because I was broke. And hurt people hurt people. So I'm like, nobody knows my struggle, just like you guys are probably thinking, maybe. And I said, oh, fine then. I'll find my family. And then I got what, what some of us may know is the Tupac mentality. It's me against the world. Because of the people that are supposed to take care of me don't. I got this. Well, did that get me out of victim mode? Sure, did I have a reason to be angry? Yes or no? I did, right? So I went from victim mode to survivor mode. Now it's a Tupac mentality, right? Like, I'm going to go get this. So here's the thing is, that same year, I told you it was the spring semester of my junior year, right? Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, my father comes home drunk and tries to shoot me and my brothers. Christmas Eve. How was your Christmas Eve? And at that point, I was forced out of my home. So statistics will show you and tell you that I should be dead, homeless, or in prison. And a lot of my youth was spent running. Running. Running from the cops. Running from people in authority. And I had two lives. Because the one, no, one way I would tell myself is I'm not going to let this define me in my mind. And so what I did is I chased ambition. So I became president of that school. I became the valedictorian. I got accepted to every single university that I applied to, including West Point Military Academy. And if you know about the academy, you got to get nominated by a vice president, senator, or congressman. I got the call when I wasn't even at home. So yay for me that I understood that I needed to bring myself out of that situation. I'm a first generation college student. And that's a good thing. But do you think that that made me completely happy? You think I was still angry? I was. There's a uh, leadership expert by the name of Simon Kinnock. Travels the world, writes many books. And he talks about this golden circle. And he, and he, he uses Apple. Any iPhone users, if you are, right? So Apple. He says, I, Apple is a great company. Why? Because people in the company know their why. Most people know what they do at a company. They may know how they do it, but they never really know why they do it. And I thought about that for a second. I said, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good philosophy, but it's missing something. And this is my message I bring to you all today, is that you'll never get to your why until you understand your who. You with me? You'll never get to your why unless you understand your who. Because your mission, your purpose, is directly tied to your identity. And so for a broken guy like me, who experienced all forms of abuse by such an early age, my view of my who was completely shattered. I saw myself as the sum total of my fears and my weaknesses, of my abuse. I became a victim of the circumstance, and I let that define me. And even though I have some achievements that I overcame with, that never really fulfilled me. And right now, you have a world that's telling you to do you and get yours. Maybe some of your situations are very much like mine. Maybe it's even worse for you. And does that define you? Are you going to allow that to dictate every decision you make in your life? in a negative way. Because my dad is my dad. He got handed down crazy. I'm not here to demonize my father. I'm not here to demonize my family. But I am here to say that we all have choices. My two, I have two older brothers and a younger brother and a younger sister. My two older brothers in particular face, between us three, the most abuse in the family. We did a lot to try to protect my younger siblings. 
I today stand before you speaking about your purpose, your work, about God, about faith, about your call to be great. And I've got three brothers who are divorced, three brothers who struggle with any type of relationship with God, a brother who's a two-time felon. Why? Why? What's different between him and me? Choices. And I've had tearful conversations with my brother. It breaks my heart, guys. I've got 16 nieces and nephews of whom I don't have relationships with because we're all, we serve different gods. We live different life. I am not going back to where I came from. Amen? I'm not going back there. And they're still trying to live in that past. They're trying to live in that shadow. They're still in the victim mentality. They don't even want to be survivors. And the survivor is still passive. Our call is to be soldiers and even more so to be saints. You know, when it comes to your work, I don't know what the situations are, the great, our grades like in here. Maybe right now you're like, you know what, John, the school thing, whatever, man. I don't even know what, I don't even know if I'm going to walk in and find my dad dead. I don't even know, I mean, my dad's not even in my life. My mom's not even in my life. Or my mom's got to work three jobs to get me a meal, maybe. And my heart hurts for you and if you're in that situation. But is that going to mean it's your out? Screw it, I don't care. If you don't get your education, if you don't go to work, who does it impact? Your teacher? You think it impacts me? Who does it impact? Who? You. you. And you probably hear it a lot, that nobody can take away your education. And that's important. Again, I'm not just here to, to talk about education. I'm also here to, I'm talking about even something more important, like your dignity, who you are as a person. And, and from my perspective, from a faith perspective, and you are in a Catholic institution, you are a child of God, made in his image and his likeness. And you're designed for greatness. Say, I'm designed for greatness. Say it with me. I'm designed for greatness. I'm designed. I don't think any one of y'all woke up today and said, hey, man, I want to suck today. Anybody wake up like that? You're like, well, I'm going to hit my alarm. Be like, man, I can't wait to suck today. Anybody do that? No? Some of you are like, well, kind of, man. Okay, we have those days, right? But you don't wake up and be like, dang, I can't wait to suck. I can't wait to be mediocre. I can't, I can't wait to be lower than low. Anybody here? And if you are, we need to get you help. Because that's real for some people. And I'm not trying to be funny. Each and every one of you desire in the depths of your heart and soul to be great. You just don't believe in yourself. You just let your circumstances dictate everything thereafter. I could have done the same thing. And as we like enter into this spring break week and the rest of your educational career, y'all need to start asking some really profound questions. Like, really, we can go about it every single day. But have you really asked yourself, well, who am I? Like, what is my purpose? What's the family life that I come from? Is that what I want for me? Am I going to let the brokenness, the woundedness, the trauma, the hurts, the disappointments affect me negatively? Or am I going to use that as a fuel, as a fire? to be change in the world, right? We live in a crazy world, yes? That we're crazy. I mean, we know about all the shootings that are going on. There was another one in Northern California today. We are just looking at that, Northern Cali, two hours away from where I live. Another one. You don't got to do but step two, two steps outside of Memphis Catholic to see the world's crazy. You, we probably go home to it. So it's very difficult to see, like, light in that darkness, yeah? But here's the thing for you. I've heard uh, other inspirational speakers use this example. You guys ever see stars? 
stars in the sky? Can you see them in the day? When do you see them? At night. In the dark. And what I see is several hundred stars. But do you see that? Do you see a star? Do you see somebody designed for greatness? That's a real question, y'all. Because like, there's two types of people in this world, people that say and people that do. Are you a sayer or a doer? Do you walk or do you talk? Huh? That's the gut check. I even did seventh graders are like, dang, John, I'm just trying to get through math, bro. Why are you getting all intense, right? Dude, trying to make it through theology class, you're getting all crazy on me. No, because this is coming from a place of love. Like true love, y'all, is willing the good of the other person and doing something about it. Not standing still. Maybe the oldest person here is 18, 19 years old. If I had somebody that stood up here when I was 18 and 19 years old telling me that there's a better way, I pray I, I, pray I had somebody. Like, I wish I had somebody to tell me that, you know what, the way you're living, John, I'm sorry for everything you went through, bro, but that's not you. That's not what you're called to be. Any athletes in the room? Raise your hand if you're an athlete. Now, you work out, right? You work on your game, your skill, you're like, kind of, man, a little bit, a little bit, I'm getting there, right? But why do you work out? To get better. Do you surround yourself with other players that, are, that, that challenge your game or not? Yeah. Because psychology will tell you that you become the average of the five people you hang around. Who are you hanging around with? Good people or bad people? People that make you better or make you worse. This is what we're talking about. Like, you want to get out of your situation? How many of you want a better situation by show of hands? If you're brave enough, who wants a better situation than what they have right now? Raise your hand. OK, of those people with your hands, right? keep them raised. What are you willing to do to get there? Ah, that's. The $65,000 question is because we can all say we want to do something. But when it's time for the rubber to meet the road, the flesh to the bone is who's willing to do something about it? A perfect example of that. Who, how many of you think it's good to eat healthy and to work out? Stand up. Stand up if you think it's good to eat healthy and to work out. Stand up. Y'all looking around too, like, let me see. I'm a size of the room. Who's not standing up? Okay. Of you standing, of those same people who said, I think it's a good idea, how many of you diet and work out more than four times a week? Yeah, go to sit down. Go ahead, sit down. All right. So that's a lesson. Go ahead and take a look at the ones still standing. All right. Go ahead and sit down, my friends. You just got a lesson in ideals versus values. Oh, that sounds nice. That's good. But somebody who values something sacrifices and does something about it. So you can say you want a better scenario, but are you willing to grind for it? Are, you know, we talk about the grind. Are you willing to, to work as hard as you can to overcome those obstacles? There's a scripture passage. In all of the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, that talks about the Gerasene demoniac. Okay? And so this demoniac had multiple demons. He was possessed. And he used to walk around naked in the tombs, and they couldn't chain him down. And he used to block the roadway so people couldn't even pass the road. So Jesus, when he shows up to visit this town, the demoniac runs up to him and says, what do you have to do with us, son of the most high God? And Jesus says, what's your name? He says, legion, for we are many. And legion is like a legion of army, like 6,000. So when he's saying legion, this person is possessed with over 6,000 demons. And the story goes on to tell in scripture that Jesus then sent him away into the swine. And then that, then that man was healed of his possession. 
and then the blockage was removed. People could travel the road. And so that demoniac, that, that man who's now freed from the demons, went back to tell everybody in the town, and the town all runs up, and they're like, they're amazed, but then they asked Jesus to leave. You need to leave. Is that weird to you? That if, imagine this in our own town. If there was somebody, a demon that was always blocking the entrance right here, causing ruckus, right? Scaring all of you. And I showed up and I got rid of him. And then you finally can walk freely. And you say, John, you got to go, man. It's as if those people got comfortable with that obstacle. And so my question for you is, what are the demons in your life? What's the obstacle in your life that you're comfortable with? That now becomes your reason that you could just give up. That you could say, you know what, I'm not going to try. Because I'm, I, it's too hard. It's too difficult. Because I've got to reevaluate my life, John, and then I've got to make changes. I've got to decide that this, this friend isn't good for me. This lifestyle isn't good for me. This relationship isn't good for me. And I'm not strong enough for that. But I'm going to complain about it over and over and over again. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting difficult or different results. You've got to be renewed in your mind. In order to be renewed in your mind, you've got to be renewed in your hearts. And so if you have to be renewed in your hearts, you've got to decide and, 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 and really evaluate, what am I putting there? Jesus in the gospel tells us from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. How are you speaking? Proverbs 18, 20, 18, 21 says, death and life is in the power of the tongue. That means that we speak life or death onto somebody. Are you speaking life or death onto people? When somebody encounters you, are they better or are they worse? We as a people, we want to see change in the world, you got to be the change. You want to see a peaceful nation, you being peaceful in your own circles? You want to rise up out of your situation? Well, what are you doing to rise up instead of just laying down? Hitting snooze every time. You know, and I travel a lot, and I speak to a lot of youth, thousands of youth on a given basis every year. And I also speak to a lot of adults and parents. And there's a disconnect between y'all and us. You don't think we understand you, we don't think you understand us. And I say that because I'm a parent. I'm married, I got three kids. I know you thought I was only 19. That's just that Pacific Islander skin. I use good lotion, you can holler at me later. But there's that disconnect. And we don't even want to get intimate with one another. We don't want to know each other. And I don't mean intimate in a, in a, in a sexual way. I mean intimate like, who is the person behind you? Who is the person behind you? You're not your, your struggle. You're not your family scenario. You're not that failed class. You're not that ambition to get on the basketball team, but you didn't even make the cut. That's something about you. You may have a like or a dislike. Yeah, but that's not the you. Let's give you a perfect example of that, why we shy away from that. So for those of you who have somebody next to you, look at that person for me. And I want you to, so all y'all should be looking at somebody. And I want you to look at that person in the eye. No laughing, no making faces. You're just looking at deep in their eyes. Deep in their eyes. I'm going to give you one minute. And you're just going to stare at that person. In their eyes. No laughing, no talking, no nothing. No talking, no laughing. You only got 45 more seconds, not that long. Keep looking at them. And I'm not saying look at the eyebrow or look at the nose. I said look them in their eye. In their eye. Don't look at their pretty hair, that mole on their chin, the hair on the mole.
15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, Sammy, they're not done yet. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. How was that? Horrible, right? That was the longest minute ever. Why don't you just stab me in my eye, bro? Okay, why is that awkward? Share with me. Why is it awkward? Yes. Why is it awkward? You can't stop laughing, my man. Why is it awkward? Oh, one of y'all? No, I thought one of you guys were raising up. No? <laughs> why is it awkward? Huh? What did you say? You can't what? You're not supposed to look at a guy in his, okay. Why though? Yes, my man. You don't look at people that long, right? Does somebody have back here? No? Well, I mean, for guys, right? Like back in my day, it was like when you looked at me for more than two seconds, like, what you looking at, man? Right, that's, that's what it is, right? You got a staring problem? Matter of fact, we used to have language in my, my islanders would be like, do I owe you money or what? And I'd be like, what you talking about? I'm like, quit looking at me. But you see what that culture does? We don't want to look, why? Because it's, it feels weird, but you're vulnerable. When you're looking at me, there's a certain level of intimacy you need to have. Like intimacy, like into me see. You can see the me behind the me. And what happens is the culture, the music, the media, this everything that's out there tells you what? That instead of loving people and using things, we love things and we use people. So when I decide to take away the person in you, you're no longer a person, you're a thing. Go ahead, you clap that one up. So the reason why it's uncomfortable is because we're uncomfortable with ourselves. You don't know you. You don't spend enough time with you. You sit there and try to put on the fronts just like I do every single day. The mask that we put on because we'd rather be popular than be loyal. We'd rather be famous than be faithful. You'd rather be liked and follow than being loved and being a leader. To love, to love means to give yourself away in complete gift, like the cross. That's why I love my Catholic Christian faith, because I, I'm shown what it means to be a man, a biblical man, that my life matters nothing unless I give it away, first to my wife and then to my children and then all y'all. I'm here not because, I, because of any other reason other than love. The world tells you, and a lot of you didn't even stand up, that there is no true love. And I'm here to challenge you with it. There's love. You were made out of love, for love, to love, from love. Yeah. You were made out of love, for love, to love, and from love. So your hearts will be restless until it rests in God, and it's rest in serving each other, until it rests in, instead of using people, you love them. And loving them means you lead them to a better version of themselves. You make them better. That the power of death and life is in your tongue, is in your actions, is in your prayers. It's in everything you're doing to make yourself better so that they can be edified and, and by your very presence. So as you enter into spring break and you break away from the school things, Maybe I challenge you to not consume yourself with things that don't make you better. To really think about when you come back, what do you guys got a week off? So when you guys return to school in a week from now, that you've made a commitment to yourself, that you're not gonna let your situation or your circumstance define you, and that you truly decide to change your circumstance. Because in the end of life, whether that's tomorrow, two years, 20 years, 40 years from now, the only person that's going to be responsible is the person in the mirror for everything that you did and everything you didn't do, everything you said and everything you didn't say. That's reality. You can play the blame game, but that got me nowhere other than more hurt. 
So it's a blessing and an honor to be here with all of you. But I do want to leave you with that. Your who, your who matters. And that who is a child of God made in his image, in his likeness, designed for greatness, made for more. The world needs not survivors. They need saints. They need people who are willing to lay their life down. Just like our Lord said, no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for a friend, for a brother, for a sister. Your faculty here, your teachers, administration, they care a lot about y'all. And it may not seem like it sometimes. And it's a challenge to them too. Are they loving you in all your brokenness, in all your woundedness, in your whole situation, in the way that honors the dignity of who you are as a person? See, we start, you want to, you want to, help repair some of the issues we're dealing with in our culture, be a bridge. Talk to each other. Dialogue. Quit making assumptions. Quit judging. And I don't mean judging behavior. I mean, don't assume you know me. You don't know me. But get to know me. I don't mind you want to sit here and look me in the eye. I mean, it will get awkward probably after a minute. But I don't mind that. Why? Because you actually care enough to sit with me. Get to know me. Understand where I come from. Understand what drives me, what I'm passionate about. What do I need healing from? So that way, when I see you in the hall, I can say, hey, man, I thought about you the other day. I hope everything's going OK at home. I said a prayer for you. Or, hey, hey, girlfriend, yeah, hey, I hope that test went OK. I know you're real stressed out, and I finally felt it for you. That's how we rebuild a culture of life instead of speaking death on people. You are the answer to the future. But instead of worrying about the future, think of the now. Think of the now and do it now. Because while other, while other people are thinking it, we do it. We do it, yeah, amen? We go after it right now. Right now. And be a change. Be a light. And show this world what we can do when we come together. God bless you. I'm all yours. Anybody have questions you want to ask me? Just raise your hand. Yes, my man back there. Stand up so we can yell it out. The island Guam, G-U-A-M. Where is it? The Pacific Island just south of uh, Hawaii, Japan. It's a little island. It's 38 by 8 miles long, 150,000 people. It's very small. Yes, my dear. Yes. How, do, how does it feel what? Uh, you know, she asked, how does it feel to be almost shot by your dad? Um, it's a great question. And I would say that that father wound, my father since passed. He passed away in 2008. And the father wound that I had, it's not natural for a parent or even just human, human beings, to, to have that kind of uh, anger or that kind of evil inside of you. And I, and I think for me, personally, that, that really shook my world and I headed down a dark place because I couldn't experience love the way that God intended love for me to be loved, right? So I think that that moment, obviously I was very scared, right? And I ran for my life and, and, and I, it just led to a little dark moment in my, in my life. But Today, when I look back on that, I, I, I still pray for my father. And I hope that he had conversion in his own heart, in his own life. And now, I, I vow to be the best husband, the best father, 
the best man that I could possibly be and to share and help other men be real men. All right, so. Who else? Notice I get hot, because I just like fire, right? So sorry. Yes. I was what? Yes. I was, you said molested? Yeah. I was sexually molested by a cousin. I, yes, I, was, I ran with gang-related for a long time. Ran, ran in, in uh, well, actually, in my middle school years, start, starting that, after that 11th grade experience, I'm sorry, 11-year-old experience, in 12th grade, or sorry, 7th grade, is when I got caught up with basically gang-related gang folks. So that's why I got arrested, because we were fighting in public. What gang was I in? Why are you looking to join or what, man? To be honest with you, the parent gang was what they call Sons of Samoa. And they're, uh, they were just big Islander guys, just dudes from LA. But we actually were just a little, it was like the baby brothers of that gang, right? So it was really more of my friends. Um, we were just connected to the gang. But you are, you're walking around and you, people are trying to shoot you and stab you. I mean, I would leave school, I'd walk home from school, and a truckload of seven guys would pull up and jump me. That was like an everyday affair. So I'd try to find different ways to get home. I'd walk out of football games, and there'd be 30 guys, and I'm not exaggerating, 30 guys waiting to beat me. That was what gang life is. So, but I was hanging around broken people. Yes? What motivated you to be a motivational speaker? You know what? My wife. Honestly, he asked, what, what motivated me to be a motivational speaker is my wife. You know, if it wasn't for my wife, she sacrificed a lot, man. I wasn't, I wasn't being the man. Yeah, there's behind every good man is a greater woman. I'll tell you that. Um, but in all honesty, she made a lot of sacrifices because I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. And I wasn't healed. I didn't realize how much my, my, my upbringing really uh, traumatized me. And uh, once I got, when I started down that path of healing, and what she saw, the change in my own marriage and the change with my relationship with my daughter and my two sons, she says, you need to go, you need to go help other men. You need to go help our youth because there's too many people like you, unfortunately. My wife comes from broken. You thought I had a bad, she was on her own at 16. She comes from divorce. She comes from abuse. And so you put us together, we were firecrackers. You know what I mean? We were just, it was... If, if there wasn't God in our life, it's like a match made in hell, because we were broken people, you know. <laughs> and we're high school sweethearts. So I met her when I was a sophomore. And, uh, you know, I believe that God set us up together, because that's the only way that I was going to get back to him. So she's really my motivation, and now my kids are my motivation. And honestly, you guys are my motivation. If I really say that I love you, well, what am I willing to do about it? Am I going to come up here and get, I mean, you, you think it's easy? No, you got to unzip yourself and be vulnerable. And say, you know what, I'm broken, I come from hurt. Yeah, I was molested, yeah, I was this, yeah, I was that. But that don't define who I am. Come over here and give me a hug, and then we, let's call it a day. Let's go to work, right? So, yeah, my wife. Pray for her. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? It could be anything. Well, maybe not anything. <laughs> Put his hand on. Okay, well, fine. Did somebody ask? Yes. What's my favorite part about doing this? Uh, this part of it, actually. Uh, when people actually open up and, 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 and want to be better, it's, it's those, those personal conversations that somebody says, you know what? Like, hey, John, that, that story touched me. Thank you. I want to be, that. I want to be a better man, or I want to be a better woman, or I, I came from abuse, too. What did you do to heal? So when I can help you down that process of healing and inspire you just to change, that's, that's worth everything. That's worth everything. Yes. Yes. How tall am I? How old? How are? How am I? How are you? I'm good. I'm confused. Help me out. I'm not. Even. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, I see the R, girl. 
how are you? I'm great. Yeah. Well, college, I just went to a state university. So what happened is I went to West Point. So if you know what, anybody know about the military academies? You got Annapolis and Air Force, they're really hard, right? So I left, I got nominated by a congressman, and I thought, and the island of Guam got all crazy. They started writing papers on me. They sent me to go see the governor of Guam. They sent me to DC, and I felt like, I don't want to go to military. I don't want to go to the academy, but what am I going to say? So I went to West Point for two months. I just did the, the beast barracks, and then I left. I decided this ain't for me. And uh, you know, everyone was upset, and um, that, was a choice, that was a choice I made. So I ended up, all, all the scholarships I did receive all went away. And yeah, exactly, because I went, I took on West Point, which is a quarter of a million dollar scholarship, and every, I, I cleaned the house at Senior Awards Night, and they all went away because I went to West Point. So I came back, I applied to the colleges I wanted to go to, couldn't happen, nobody gave me money, I wasn't living at home, um, and so I just went to work, put myself through school. So I went to a local state university, got my bachelor's in science and computer information systems, and then I went on to get my master's degree in business administration, and I'm working on my second master's in master's of theology. Yes, my man. How long have I been doing this? Since 2015. 2015, and I was just I was sharing with the gentleman Bill who brought me out here. Um, it's actually crazy. One, I never knew, and there's a whole other story. Like this whole faith conversion thing is a big deal, and maybe some of you men can come to my to talk tomorrow because you hear some of that. But what was amazing is I was at the bottom of the barrel. I didn't like who I was. I was getting ready to lose my wife and my kids. Job was just terrible, and I really gave my, li my life to God. And I said, you know what, I'm done. I'm done doing me. I'm done letting this define me. Everything's yours, God. And from that point on, I started this journey. And it wasn't, I never would have guessed I'd be here. But in all, I did a bunch of talks last year, right? All the talks I did in 2017, I'm doing more than that in just these first three months, right? So when you give your life, and you fully surrender, and you are living out what you're being called to do, God's going to bless that. So it's been since 2015. Yes, yes. I do watch Eric Thomas, of course. How bad do you want it? Right? Eric Thomas, is a Jeremy Anderson, there's a couple of these other guys that are really good motivational speakers. And they're coming from a place of, and the nice thing about what they're doing, Dr. Eric Thomas, right, is these guys know hard. They know struggle. They know, they know homelessness, right? But they also know that you can't just be overly ambitious in going after what the world wants. They care about your soul, too. And so there's an element of spirituality and faith that's really good. But yeah, Dr. who doesn't know Dr. Eric Thomas? Right? Yes. Uh, who's your biggest role model? Who's my biggest role model? Other than Christ. Other than Christ. Um, man, that's a good question. Um, I have to answer that in a couple of different ways. One of the biggest people I owe my life to is my wife, uh, honestly. I mean, if, if it wasn't for her sacrifices, man. Like, she chose to stay by me, guys. And, and it, that matters. She understood her vows, that we were, we're in a covenantal relationship and that, that uh, a real marriage. See, because what happens is when you take your vows, you don't know this yet, but you say, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad. What most people hear is rich, health, good. <laughs> My wife's been through me, been with me and, and through all of this. So she's, she's definitely somebody that drives me uh, and motivates me because of her own sacrifices. Um, but I would say I actually have uh, a real, real dear priest friend of mine who's a, a role model to me. He's my spiritual director. And he's been with me through all. He's given my kids all my sacraments. He's, he's given my wife and I the sacrament of marriage. But he's literally been with me through everything difficult in my life. And he's never, ever judged me, but he's always pushed me. And so he's somebody I look to because he works in the Archdiocese of San Francisco, which is like the belly of the beast when it comes to crazy. I'm from Cali, right? We put cray cray in crazy, right? Northern California, San Francisco is crazy. And he's out there and he's fighting the good battle. So he's definitely, if I look at this like a human level, there's that, that priest. And then I've got other like little people that I think I look at as, um, I say little people, and just the everyday grind. But a lot, of, a lot of saints. For me as a Catholic, a lot of the saints, I, like St. Jose Maria Escriva, things like that, that, that really drive me. Yes? Do you play any sports? 
I did. I was a football guy. What's that? Did I pay what? I don't even know what that is. I, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Dang, did I just show my age? I don't even know what that is. I, d I don't know. I don't play it, obviously. Yes? Do I have any advice? Yeah, uh, let's find help. Right? So don't, here's the thing is we got to break cycles, man. And for a long time, I just perpetuated the cycle. Right? Meaning, I just kept doing what I was doing. I, I fed into the culture. Don't let the culture define how you're going to deal with this issue, but get help. Sometimes that's mental health help. See counselors here. Uh, sometimes that's spiritual help. Right? And see, I ignored the, the mental health. I ignored it. I ignored the spiritual. All I said is, well, I'm going to go get rich. That's what I said. I'm going to go be that guy. Six figures by age 30. Six figures by age 30. You think that solved my problems? No, I was still broken. All right, so I would say if somebody wants, you need to seek help. And you need to seek help from people that are really trying to help you. Not hurt you, not oppress you, not lead you down the wrong path, but somebody who's going to value what you value and hopefully lead you to a set of values. And I think that should be mentally, emotionally, spiritually. But find somebody that can help you. And there's plenty of resources. And I'd be ha happy to point you in several directions if you need to. So you can come see me after. Okay? Yes. Okay. You came all professional right now, man. I'm just like ready. Like, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yes. <laughs> My man. So, so how old do I look? How old do I look? 36. 40. Dang, some of you are like 40. 44? Dang, hold on. I'm 41. Ah! Hey, that used to be a young thing. What's going on here? I'm 41. As far as my annual income, why are you trying to get in my business, bro? Why are, you, are you IRS? What's going on? I make good money. That's all I would say. I'm blessed. So I make good money. I work in technology. I'm a technology exec. I don't know if that's where God's always going to call me. But here's what I will tell you. Is I make good money and, and it started turning around for me financially. Um, it's funny. When I was chasing the dream, I was doing well, but I was always wanting more. Ever since I don't care about my salary, God's blessed me. I got, you know, I'll get... Uh, I don't even have to worry about my life right now in the sense of finances. But at the same time, I'll tell you, I'll walk away from this job in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. If it ever crossed between my faith and my family. Ever. Matter of fact, when I was, uh, when my, the owners of the company I'm at now, this is a good story, I'm going to give you this as a, as a probably the, one of the last things we can talk about when it talks about courage. They were testing my Catholicism. I came and I said, I left the job I was at. I was working for a $3 billion company, and I was targeted as the next chief information officer. All I had to do was sit there, okay? All I had to sit there and wait for the dude to retire. And that job, and I'm not kidding you, was worth $250,000 base salary. And I probably would get a $50,000 or 50% bonus on top of that if I just sat there. My picture was on the succession plan. But I had to be an ugly, pompous prick, and I had to step on people. Okay? And so I said, not doing it. So I left. So I went to go interview at this other company. I said, hey, you have these values on your wall. Do you live them? And they're like, what? I'm like, you have values on the wall. You respect people. Do you really respect people? And they're like, where's this guy coming from? I said, because I come from a place that has values on the wall too, but they don't live them. And I'm going to let you know now, I'm Catholic, and it's all about God and my family. Okay, we respect that. And then they asked me to do things that were against my, what I wanted for my family. And I said, hey, I'm not doing that. They wanted me to go to some crazy thing. I don't know. They, wanted me, they, were, they were big on trying to build social life and hang out. And I said, I'm not, do, I'm not hanging out. I'm not going to Vegas. I'm not doing all that. So the owner met with me. He said, we need to go have coffee. I need to talk to you. And he says, 
You mean to tell me if I, the president, the person who signs your text, tells you to go, you're not going to go? I said, not only am I going to tell you no, I'm going to tell you, hell no. <laughs> and if you ever think you're going to step in between my faith and my family, you're tripping. I come from nothing. I'll work five jobs to support my family. And he goes, you're lucky you're good at what you do, or I'd probably fire you. I said, you need me to go find another job because I'll be happy to resign right now. Mm -hmm. ne needless to say, needless to say, I'm still there. They're giving me plenty of raises and they're happy that I'm there because I make them better. You see what I'm saying? So I said, you know what? Call me out on it. I'm saying I'm Christian. I'll make your company better. I'll make your people better. I'll make my department better. And I've made them better and I'm there five years later. So when we stand firm in your convictions, it shows people what courage really is. So I don't know if we have time, Deacon, for more. They have one more question. One more question for you, my man. What's that? Where do you, I just work at a local uh, retail company in my area. So they have about 20 different stores across three different counties. And so my job, I'm the director of technology, and I manage all the technology for the facility. So any of the softwares, the phones, the, the servers, all the security stuff and the cybersecurity, that's all me and my, my department. So as a local private firm, because I'm done with big company. I just work for a little private guy, multi-million dollar company. They take care of me. It's a seven minute commute. I get home to my family. I get to take days off and come and preach. Life is good. God's blessed me. All right, guys. Yes.